through verse 17. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. We're working our way expositionally through the book of Romans. We've been there all year, and this text is of great value to us. This is going to be beautiful. So be prepared for what the Lord would show us here in these verses. Beginning here in verse 12 of chapter 8 of the book of Romans, reading from the English Standard Version. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now let's pray together. Father, what a joy it is to be able to come this morning to your word, particularly from Romans chapter 8. These verses, Lord, they're going to be encouraging. They're going to be helpful to us. Lord, I, I pray that you would, in spite of the messenger, Lord, would you make this message resonate with all the hearts here? Would it be a help to them? And Lord, that you would bless this time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm not going to go through a long introduction or anything. We're going to get right into the text. We're going to try to see what the Lord has for us because we do want to gather around the Lord's table in just a a few minutes as we uh, continue to um, recognize the value of the gospel for us as we come as weary pilgrims. We come looking for rest and this reminder of the bread and the cup will help us to do that. And so now this text that we're looking at now, remember that as I said last Sunday, that what we find here in these verses in Romans chapter 8 is not so much command, not so much imperative, but indicative. In other words, what is being said is true about the believer. And particularly what is true about the believer and the relationship that he or she has with the Holy Spirit. And so this is going to be true of every believer. Well, that is what is said. Every true believer can know that these things are true about him or her. These are the facts. And so when we get to these verses, we understand it's not so much uh, that we leave thinking we've got to do something, but we leave here this morning being refreshed in who we are in Christ. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to try to unpack this for us, and we'll do it uh, in a way that hopefully will be of help and encouragement to you. The three things that we're going to say is that, number one, the Holy Spirit gives the believer a new life. The Holy Spirit gives each believer a new life. Secondly, the Holy Spirit gives the believer a new sense of God's care, a new sense of God's care. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit confirming the believer's spiritual and eternal inheritance. The Holy Spirit confirming that inheritance that we have promised to us. And so let's think about verses 12, and th- four, 12, 13, and 14. We're just going to work our way through the text as we normally do. We're going to start with thinking about how the Holy Spirit gives the believer a new life. Now, let's go back just for a moment because it's going to be important for us to think about the fact that remember that every person who comes to faith in Christ receives the Holy Spirit in the full. There's not partial given of the Holy Spirit. There's not degrees of the Holy Spirit given. Each person who comes to sincere, true faith in Christ, counting on the work and person of Christ for that salvation, will receive the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what, remember, John the Baptist said when he is preaching in the wilderness, and he said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Remember also, uh, Jesus was saying at the Feast of Booths uh, one particular uh, on occasion, and, and he talked about living water. Living water will be uh, given to you, and, and, and if you'll come and seek Jesus and, and drink of him, you'll never be thirsty again, and that living water will be like rivers flowing from you, and he was referring to 
the fact that the Holy Spirit would indwell each believer. That's in John chapter 7, uh, beginning there in verses 37, 38, and 39. Uh, We even see in John chapter 14, when the Last Supper, when Jesus is explaining to the disciples that he's about to go and they can't go with him, they don't understand what he's talking about, his death, and so they're confused. They are um, not quite grasping all that Jesus is saying to them. They know that they've been with him, and they're sad. And Jesus said, listen, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Orphans, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to come. So the Holy Spirit has been promised, and the Holy Spirit is our helper. He's our comforter. He's our guide. And this particular chapter, Romans chapter 8, is what is true of the believer because the believer has been justified by faith in Christ, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And because a person believes, then these things can be said about that person, and this person would know these things are the reality for him or her who are in Christ. So the first thing that I would say to you from the verses that are before us in verses 12 through 17 is, as I said, the Holy Spirit gives the believer new life. Now look at this, verse 12. So then, brothers, so what is he referring back to? Particularly verses 9 through 11, but if you'll just look at verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that is, in each believer, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh because the Holy Spirit has given you life because the Holy Spirit has done a a work in you, because the Holy Spirit has been graciously given to you, then this is not, this is true of the believer. You are not obligated. You do not any, in any way owe any debt to live according to the flesh. Your life does not have to be dominated by indwelling sin. You owe nothing to a life of disobedience. You know, you owe nothing to a life of condemnation. That's the idea. You have, you have disowned the claims of the indwelling spirit of God upon you, and you do not practice the life of habitual sin. That's why it says you are not a debtor to the flesh. You don't have to give in to the habitual nature of indwelling sin. Now, we know that we do give in. We know that we sin. We know that we rebel against the commands of God. We know that we have attitudes, actions, motives, intentions, desires that are all twisted, perverted by indwelling sin. We can read Romans 7, verses 14 through 25 in Remember, that's just a great text for the battle that Christians face every day until the end, until we leave this life, we will face that battle of indwelling sin. And so we will sin. But we don't have to be dominated by the sin nature. We don't have to give in to it. We don't owe anything to live according to its desires and what it pressures us to do, whether it's internal or external. We owe nothing to it. That's a new life. That's a life that you cannot live apart from the Holy Spirit and what Christ has done for us. That's a life in which you are changed. Patrick referenced it this morning in our Sunday school hour. It's a, you are a new creature because you have a, a new life. And so look, the, the rest of the verse says to live according to the flesh. You don't have to live according to the flesh. You're not a debtor to that. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. That is, that's the natural consequence of a life that is habitually lived under the rule, under the mastery of indwelling sin, of the constant giving in or disobedience. What the natural consequence is, is death. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now, it doesn't just mean, obviously, just a physical death. Certainly that is true. 
And sometimes we see the consequences of habitual sin in a person's life that bring natural death. But the reference and the point that's being made here is not just that you will die physically, because we know we all will. These bodies are wearing down. They're, they're um, um, ticking um, time bombs of death because we are um, wearing down physically, emotionally, spiritually. But this means that if you continue in a habitual pattern of sin, it, you will find yourself spiritually separated from God forever. You will die spiritually. You will die eternally to the grace of God. You won't die eternally because you're going to live eternally. Everybody lives inter- eternally. You either live eternally in the presence of God or you live eternally out of the presence of God. That This is referring to living out of the presence of God. That is out of his grace, that is his saving grace, and even out of his common grace that everybody enjoys. We see the sun come up, we feel the breeze on our face. Those things are common graces. You will not experience those eternally separated from God. And so this is a very serious thing. But notice now that if you live according to the flesh, then certainly you will die. But there's the contrast. But if by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit that indwells each believer, believer, if you live by putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You'll have life. You'll have life abundantly here. You'll have life eternally in the future. But put to death the deeds of the body. So this is what happens for us as believers. We are given a new life, and in that life we are putting to death the deeds of the body. That is the flesh. We're putting to death the deeds of the sinful nature. We're putting to death those habitual sins. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to put to death the deeds of the body? That is the works, the attitudes, the intentions, the desires of the body. Well, it certainly doesn't mean that there be a total absence of sin from the life of the believer. It doesn't mean that. It can't be that. It can't mean that because, again, as I referenced just a moment ago, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, gives you the reality of the Christian life, that we all struggle, we all fight against sin, we all are flawed, we are all failing, and we all agree with God that we've sinned against him. That's the difference between us and the lost person is we have willingly agreed with God that we have sinned and then we would go so far to stand with God against our sin. And we would seek the remedy that God provides for our sin and not try to remedy that in our, of ourselves. So the, the idea of, of putting to death the deeds of the flesh is, is just what you would imagine. It's the constant battle against sin. It's the daily fight that we have against sin. It's um, the refusal to allow the eye to wander, uh, the mind to contemplate those things that are not godly. It's the refusal to let the hand grasp those things that are sinful. Um, It is um, the refusal to let the affections run after those things that we know that would be against God. It's that constant struggle. It's the deliberate rejection of sinful thoughts and desires and intentions and aspirations. It's that willingness to fight against it. It's the consistent um, nurturing, no doubt, of the good things that you know to be of God. It's consistently planting and watering and and nurturing those things. It's siding with God when you do sin, as I said just a moment ago, and agreeing with God that you've sinned, and you confess that sin, and you seek God's forgiveness. You stand in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, It's it's the idea of, of having, really, this new life. You have a new attitude towards sin. You don't embrace it. You don't love it. You, you, you hate what you find yourself doing. 
You hate that you continue to go back sometimes to the same sin over and over. It's a life, listen, that is characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That when you put the deed, death, the deed to the flesh, then you're doing the very opposite of the deed to the flesh. That's the idea here. And so it's a, a, a life of, of doing this continually, consistently, intentionally, making use of the means of grace that God would give us. That is church, the Bible, being involved in small group, prayer, fasting, those types of things that become means of grace to us, not means to somehow add to our righteousness that we might impress others, not means that we would use to somehow make a list of all the things that I do and you don't, but a means of grace to help us grow in our sanctification. And I'm going to show you something here that's going to be helpful to you. You're going to appreciate. Look at the very next verse. Put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All who are led by the Spirit of God. You know how the Spirit leads us? To put to death, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. See, he didn't leave us just on our own. To do it in our own strength and our own willpower I'm just going to buckle down and tighten my belt and I'm going to do this and I'm just going to grit my teeth and I'm going to get through this stuff because you won't be able to do it, right? You've tried that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if you're led by the Spirit and the Spirit indwells you as a believer, you know what He's doing? He's helping you put to death the deeds of the flesh. Isn't that good news? Man, that is good because I can't do it. I've tried it. I've tried it in my own strength. I've tried it in every way that you could ever possibly think of. I'm sure you have too. And boy, it, it just, I wind up to the sa- at the same place. But the Holy Spirit helping me, the Holy Spirit giving me guidance, the Holy Spirit convicting me, the Holy Spirit putting in his finger right on the spot that, that I justify and excuse. And he says, no, nope, can't do that. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I need all the help I can get, and I am thankful that the Holy Spirit is given to each of us as the believer to fight against sin in our lives, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Well, that's the first good news. And now there's a second good news, and that is this, that the Holy Spirit not only gives us a new life, but the Holy Spirit would, would give us as believers a new sense of, of God's care, a new sense of God's care. Now, look what is said here, because all of these things are, again, truths. They're the reality of the believer. A believer has new life. And by the way, that, that new life ought to be seen in you. That new life ought to be evident so that I don't have to guess, and you don't have to guess if I'm a true believer or not. You see the evidence of it in my life. You see a changed person. You see a a different person who is trying to to live according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. You see a person who is putting to death the deeds of the flesh. And so you ought to see that. A new life, new creature, new name, new purpose, new affections, new joy, new relationships. a life that is consistently putting to de- death the deeds of the flesh and living by the Spirit. But here's the second thing that I would say to you. The Holy Spirit gives the believer a new sense of God's care. Back to verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit, notice what it says, are sons of God. This is, this is a new idea here. This is a thought that, that really is uh, exclusive to, to Paul. It started really with Jesus. Because remember when, when Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, here's the model prayer. Here's an example of how you can pray. And he said, by the way, before you pray, you can know this, that your Father knows everything that you need. 
And then he said, play like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, right? And so Jesus was introducing something that you don't read about in the Old Testament. You don't read about the idea of God being a father and his people being his children. You don't read about that. Jesus introduced it. Paul then took up the argument for that. And he talks about it in Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4. And if you get a chance, you can read basically the same thing there as we're reading here. But he says, you're children of God. Look in John. I just want you to see the Gospel of John very quickly. Just um, one uh, text. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 1. Beginning in verse 11. Speaking of Jesus. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, two things are going on there. First of all, he is causing the work in you to come to faith in Christ. He is causing you to be born again that he particularly talks about in John chapter 3. But not only that, but he's giving you the right, the privilege to be called one of the children of God. Now, I know it's popular and uh, it would not be correct uh, totally to think that we all are children of God. We are children of God by creation. We are children of God that we are not accidents of conception. We're we're children of God and that we're not just the uh, result of um, two um, married adults coming together and uh, consummating that relationship, and then we are born. And so we're we're children of God really in that sense in in some ways, but that that leads down a path that really kind of leads to universalism and some other things that we don't want to get into. But what we want to think about is the fact that we are children of God based on a faith relationship with our old elder brother, if you will, Jesus Christ. That faith relationship then is something that is unique. It is spiritual. It is not just because we're human. It is because we have a different relationship, a, a new life of faith that is Um, in Christ with God as our Father. That's what we need to understand about this text. And so back in Romans, um, verse 14, we are sons of God. And, and of course, that would include daughters as well. The the, The point is children, children of God. Now, verses 15 and 16, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. That is, you believers, you didn't receive some kind of spirit of slavery or bondage that that you would always be in sin and that you would be fearful of death and, and fear would come upon you because of the consequences of your sin. You didn't receive that when you came to Christ. What did you do? What did you receive? But you, this is the contrast, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Now, this is a, as I said, it's a new concept. It's a new idea. That is that children of God, our believers are called children of God. They're, they're adopted. This is not justification, and it's uh, not regeneration. It's not that at all. It is connected to it. This is like looking at salvation um, uh, through a diamond, and the light has shined on that diamond, and now you've got all the different facets, and one of those facets would be adoption. And adoption, we know it in this world, in human society, as a couple of things happening. First, um, we know that adoption in our culture is about the one who's being adopted is um, benefited. Because their life without the adoption would not be 
good. It would not go as well. And so they are adopted and their life is benefited. And the other thing that we do in our culture that we think about when we think about adoption is that um, the old authority from which the one who's being adopted was under is broken. Now think about all of these things, or both of those things, I should say, in relation to spiritual truth. That is, we are adopted as a son or a daughter of God for the benefit, not that God receives, but that we receive. Not only that, but the old authority for which we lived under, the dominion of Satan and sin and self, that has to be broken and we come into a, a new relationship with God. So when Stacy and I adopted both of our children, we had to go through um, a ton of paperwork and all kinds of home visits, all kinds of uh, obstacles that were set in place because they wanted to make sure that the child that was being adopted would be benefited. Now, certainly, we did, we did benefit, and we do benefit from our children, and that is good. But the whole purpose of the adoption, the court system, was for the benefit of that child to be in the best place that they could be. And then the authority of the birth parents for both of our children had to be broken by law. They had to surrender their rights. We had to go through the court process to do that. We had to stand before a judge. We had to get lawyers. Everybody had to do the right thing. We had to watch all of our P's and Q's and dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's. Had to be perfectly done right. And the old authority was broken, and now they were placed under our authority. And it was as if that they were our biological children. There would be no difference. And they were subject to all the legal requirements, all the legal privileges of biological children. And that can't be changed. That's the idea that's going on here. The believer is established under the authority of God who is his father. Now, look at this. And now, I know where I'm taking a lot of time, but look at this. You have received the spirit of adoptions as sons. And notice what it says right at the end of verse 15. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. So God has taken the believer into a new relationship with himself. And now that relationship is defined as individual sonship with a personal father. And the believer now, listen, can call upon the creator of the universe to intercede and to work and to guide and to comfort and to help. And now the believer has a consciousness that he has a father who is in heaven that wants to provide for him or her. And listen, this is not, Abba Father is not this idea that we have of um, a child snuggling up to the parent and it, it just be kind of a restful, kind of peaceful moment. That's not what's being in, in, um, communicated here. What's being communicated here is a child who has been running and trips and falls. And they say, Daddy! They cry out. It's a cry of anguish. It's a cry of need. It's a cry of help. Abba, Father, help me. And remember when the centurion saw the death of Jesus on the cross? This is in Mark. And he said, surely this man was the Son of God. It, it's the same word. It's the same Greek word. It's crying out. He, he, that is that centurion soldier, cried out in anguish because he recognized as he watched Jesus die, he was who he said he was. And for you and I, as we go through this life and we're going on this pilgrimage, if you will, and we trip and we stumble and we fall, we have the privilege to call out, Daddy, help me. Help me. I remember when uh, we were growing up, we, we played sandlot football all the time. That's what we lived for. So we're playing with my brothers and my uncles and my dad is out there with us. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm the quarterback, and I step up, 
And if you ever do much football, you're planting your leg. I'm, I plant my leg to throw the ball. So I come back, plant my leg, and my dad falls on me right here. And I said, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wound up with a big brace for my waist to my ankle, and it was terrible. And I went in so much pain, I thought I was going to pass out. My, the, my face turned as white as the tablecloth, but I didn't want him to know that he hurt me. And I'm like, okay, let's huddle up. We're getting another play. <laughs> and uh, oh, it, was, it was just a cry of anguish, though, when he fell on me. And I was 20 years old or older. But it hurt, and it was just in that moment of crying out. That's what the believer has. We can cry out to our Heavenly Father in that moment of need, in that struggle, when the medical crisis is what it is, when the financial need is what it is, when the relationship is broken, when whatever the thing is in our life that causes us to get um, anxious and worried and fearful and doubting, we can cry out, Abba, Father! I need you. And you know what? He'll come. He'll come. Now, I don't know how he'll do it. and It may not be easy. It could be painful. As soon as I cried out with my dad when he fell on my leg, he, I, I've never seen him move that fast. Seriously. He rode off, you know, and he laid there on the ground. And I'm about to pass out. Um... But he did what he could in that moment because when, when, he, when he heard me make that cry, he knew something was wrong. Right? That's what we have as believers. The Holy Spirit gives us a, a new uh, understanding of the Father's care for us. Even in the difficulties and the hurt and the pain and all the the stuff that comes against us, uh, we have a, a new life and we have a new status as sons, as daughters, and we have a new sense of God's care. It's, it's, that's good to have this understanding of this kind of tranquil uh, feeling, this twank, tranquil resting in the presence of God. I mean, that's true in a sense, uh, but there's something greater here that we need to understand. And then finally, the last thing I would say to us as we get ready to go to the table and take the bread and the cup, uh, the Holy Spirit confirms the believer's spiritual and eternal inheritance. That's verses 16 and 17. Look, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Well, what does that mean? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. And it, probably your translation, if you're using the English Standard Version, has little spirit or little s, rather, in that sentence, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That, that means um, not just this, this um, inner voice that's kind of speaking to us. Uh, it means that the, the Spirit confirms the evidence of the fact that we're putting to death the deeds of the flesh and that we are in a new relationship with God as our Father. The Spirit is bearing witness that that is true for us. The Spirit is giving His witness, His confirmation that what is happening in the life of the believer, putting to death the, dead, the deeds of the, the flesh, and that we have a Father, and a relationship with that Father who cares for us is true. And if children, that is, if we are children of God, and it's not a, a statement of doubt or uncertainty, but if our sense we are children, then we are heirs, heirs with God and heirs with Christ. That is that we have not only the idea of a new life, not only the idea of sonship, but we have the idea of being an heir in Christ. And the witness of the Spirit confirms that. Uh, we are told in Ephesians chapter 1, that the Spirit is given as a seal to our inheritance. It's a guarantee. And so the heir of, the, we are the heirs then of what Christ has done for us. He's accomplished the work that would be necessary for us to have the right relationship with God so that we can have a new life, so that we can know what it is to, 
have that sonship kind of relationship. And we have an eternal life that is promised to us. And the Holy Spirit guarantees that. We'll talk more about that next Sunday as we continue in our uh, exposition of Romans. We'll talk about future glory. So we'll come to that verse more uh, next Sunday morning, Lord willing. Uh, But now, um, I'm going to uh, consider that uh, all of us would want to come together to uh, take the bread and the cup. Jared is going to come up and lead us in just a moment. Uh, But it is our responsibility as elders to make sure that the table is set in the right way. And so only those who have put their full trust and faith in Christ can come to this table. So that doesn't mean that we're mad at you or angry at you if you haven't come to faith in Christ. We want you to come to faith in Christ. Please come to faith in Christ. Then you can take this with us. But this is a meal that is prepared for God's people. So if you haven't come to faith in Christ, if you would just pass the elements by you, and it would be better for you for doing that. And then also, if you're not a member of this congregation, but you are a member of another congregation, and you hear the gospel preached there that you have heard preached here, even this morning, and you are in good standing and not under church discipline, then we invite you to the table to share in the bread and the cup with us. And that would be our habit, that would be our imitation to you, and so we would want you to come and uh, take the bread and the cup. If for whatever reason you feel that you need to pass it on, you probably notice the insert in the bulletin, um, guest, if you feel like that you want to pass it on to the next person, uh, feel free to do that. Every person is obedient to his or her conscience as we take the bread and the cup together. So with all that being said, uh, Duffy's going to come and lead us in our song, our hymn of, of uh, invitation, our uh, hymn of, of accepting and oper- offering us an opportunity to come to the table, and Jared will lead us in the taking of the bread and the cup. Let me pray before Duffy comes.